As you know, I'm proud to serve as fire chief for the city of Rogers, Arkansas. And if you've ever been to Rogers or really anywhere in Northwest Arkansas, you know that that is Walmart country. In many ways, Walmart is much more than the world's largest company. Our first Chief Chat presenter today will shed light on some key issues that face every one of us in our departments and in our communities back home. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our first Chief Chat this morning. Ben Hassan is a Senior Vice President and Chief Culture, Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Walmart. He will take us on a journey through the evolution of the company's culture, the development of behaviors that embrace diversity and inclusion, and the promotion of the company's external reputation. Please join me in welcoming Ben Hassan. Good morning. Oh, wow, this is not Arkansas, I can tell. I actually lived in Texas for a while, so I know y'all can do better than that. Good morning. Thank you. Um, when Chief Jenkins, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Chief Jenkins for inviting me to come. When, um, when he called and asked me to come and speak to this group, I, I kind of went, huh? You want a diversity officer to come and speak to firefighters? And um, he said, yeah, th this topic of inclusion and diversity is um, important to firefighters. But it took me back to a story um, that I'll tell first before I talk a little bit about the work that we're doing um, at Walmart. It took me back to a story in, uh, I'll date myself now, 1958. I was six years old. And uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, actually in North Philadelphia. And uh, my mother sent me out to get a loaf of bread. Yeah, I'm that old. She's over there. What? What did he say? Um, and uh, I was at my grandmother's house, and uh, they sent me out like six blocks. You probably wouldn't do that with your six-year-olds now, but they did it to me. And uh, so I went about six blocks down the street. I went in the store. I came out with the bread. Instead of turning left to head back to grandmom's, I turned right. And probably about 10 blocks down the road, I finally figured out I'm completely lost. So it's one of the reasons why I love um, firefighters, because I'm six years old, boohoo crying, lost, and I walked into a firehouse. And uh, one of the gentlemen in the firehouse said, what's wrong? I said, hey, I'm lost. Where you live? I'm like, I was at my grandma's house. I don't know where she, she's somewhere around here. So they got out of the um, firehouse, put me in the truck. Now they probably shouldn't have done that, right? They put me in a truck and drove me down the street until um, I saw my grandmother and my mother, you know, pulling their hair out, and, I, and they, you know, tooted the horn, toot toot, and my, they're, I'm like, hey, mom, grandma, and they're looking like, what are you doing up there? We've been looking for you for an hour. So um, I um, have a bias toward firefighters because of that early experience of um, uh, a safe place to go in my community. Um, so again, um, my name is Ben Hassan. Um, I've actually spent most of my career as an IT professional. And um, about three years ago, uh, the CEO of Walmart asked me if I would take on this job of um, culture, diversity, and inclusion. My title is actually pretty strange, Chief culture, diversity, and inclusion officer. Um, I obviously don't lead people who run into fires like you. So even though I'm a chief, um, I'm not that kind of chief, though we have our own fires that we have to put out in corporate America. One of the things that, um, that we've been really focused on is this notion of inclusion. Um, much like firefighters, um, the people at Walmart, they actually make the difference. We are a $500, million, $500 billion corporation. Uh, we have over 5,000 stores. We have a store in the U.S. within uh, 10 miles of 90% of the people who live in the U.S. And we have operations in 28 different countries. Um, and so this notion of um, our people and treating our people right so that they can service customers 
is very similar to what you're trying to do as you service customers. So being a tech geek, uh, one of my first uh, thoughts was, was it, what is it that causes environments, regardless of where you are, not to be inclusive? What is it about the human brain that creates a situation where we sometimes exclude people? And so we started down a path of trying to understand the science of the brain. And we invited in um, a neuroscientist to actually come and talk to us about the brain and why it is almost inherent that people can be non-inclusive. And so here's what we learned. Um, our brain actually operates in two fashions. There's a fast brain and a slow brain. The fast brain can actually process over a million frames of data in a second. Our slow brain processes about 40 frames of data in a second. So why does that matter? Well, it matters as firefighters because guess what? Under stress, you need to be able to operate quickly. You need to be able to make decisions quickly. And our fast brains have developed that capability all the way back in time when man and woman walked on planes and lived in caves. They were the weakest mammal and they had to be able to make decisions quickly. There's movement, will it eat me? Can I eat it? And sometimes, can I mate with it? So we've developed this capability to actually process data like that. So why does, it, why does that actually matter in the workplace? Well, it matters because the scientists have also run studies where they've mapped the brain when they were in a non-inclusive environment and when they were also in pain. And guess what? The regions of the brain that fire up red during that testing fires up exactly the same. If I'm in a non-inclusive environment, it's the same reaction in my brain as if I'm experiencing pain. So if I'm at work in pain, you would send me home. Yet many times, there are non-inclusive environments that people walk into every day. And guess what? They're in pain. The neuroscientists call that the social pain of non-inclusion. So why does this all matter? So let's go back to the fast brain. Guess where all of our unconscious biases lie? They lie in the fast part of our brain. The experience, life experience and exposures um, that we've gone through creates our bias. Now here's the thing about bias. A scientist will tell you this. Uh, bias is neither good nor bad, and we all have it. The problem with unconscious bias is it's unconscious. So you don't know what's operating. So how do, I, why, how do we connect this all together at, at work? So we believe that there are times when the fast brain operating with its biases is an excellent way to operate. But we also know that over the life cycle of hiring, excuse me, recruiting, hiring, developing, assigning, promotion, compensation, across the life cycle of HR, the most insidious place that bias operates, unconscious bias operates, is across that life cycle. And so we've been focused on how do you educate leaders that their biases are in play when they're making decisions over that life cycle? And how do you begin to develop what we call bias interrupters in those systems so that you think more than once when you make your decisions? Because our tendency is to operate out of our fast brain because our, our brain is the most efficient part of our body and it is constantly looking for ways to conserve energy. Have you ever gone home from work, not done anything physical, and you go, oh my God, I am exhausted? It's because your brain uses energy. So it's constantly looking for ways to conserve that energy. And so during that life cycle, we're actually educating our leaders on the fact that 
the responsibility of inclusion, the responsibility of creating an inclusive workplace, having inclusive HR processes, lies solely with the leadership. You can't teach away unconscious bias. You can't tell people not to have their unconscious bias. And remember what I said, bias is neither good nor bad. Bias that gets a good result is good bias. Bias that gets a bad result is not good bias. But along the life cycle of HR, and if you're really, as a leader, interested in creating an inclusive environment, then you've got to take time to think about how are my unconscious biases getting involved in my decisions from an HR standpoint. So as we were preparing for this session, uh, my team uh, was trying to find a catchy acronym um, uh, um, to use for the title. So that's where they came up with the FIRE F period I period R period E period. First inclusive response effect is what they titled it. So what they were really trying to help me get across to you is, particularly along the HR life cycle, your first response is typically going to include your biases. So what interrupters will you put in place so that you can have an inclusive response effect as you're making decisions along that life cycle? I think um, this will be the secret sauce for the corporations as this, as this country and this world continues to become more and more diverse. As if you look at every industry, including your own, everyone's looking to innovate. So guess what? In order to innovate, you actually have to differentiate. You have to be able to change the things you're doing today and do them in a different way. So in order to differentiate, you have to have different thoughts, ideas, opinions, people, gender, ethnicity. The ability to differentiate and innovate actually is, is tied to, to, to those two are um, tied together. But if you don't have an inclusive environment, if you don't have an environment where people can come to work today, every day and say, I feel welcome, I feel comfortable, and I feel safe, coming into this environment today, and, uh, and I can be my whole self every day and contribute in a way that I satisfy the needs of the customers that I serve. So we believe inclusion is, is very, very important. Um, I think there's an analogy between what you're trying to do in your space as firefighters and what we're trying to do in our business. So I'll close with a quick story, because old people like to tell stories, y'all, sorry. My grandkids are like, Grandpa, you've told that story 15 times. I'm like, I know, you have to listen to me again. So I actually lived here in Dallas um, for 16 years. And uh, I worked for the local gas company uh, in downtown Dallas. And um, I was out on a trip, and I got a phone call um, about a fire. And uh, my children were in the house. Um, two, three of my four children got out, um, one of them did not. This was 25 years ago. Um, my son Ben was 15 years old. He got trapped in the house. The firefighters showed up. They got him out of the house. Uh, we got him to the hospital. Uh, he never really recovered. And so I lost my son 25 years ago in this city um, but the firefighters in this city got there soon enough to get him out, to get him to the hospital, and to give us time to say goodbye to him. So um, again, I, I have a, a, a bias, a personal bias um, toward firefighters and the things that you meant to me early in my life and late in my life. And I want to say thank you um, for what you do every day and uh, Godspeed.